quoting that Bible passage we have in the uh, Matthew chapter 7 verses 13 and 14 and it goes that the Bible tells us the way it goes that we should enter by the narrow gate for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction and there are many who go in by it because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way that leads to life and there are few who find it I pray if you have found that narrow way before now or you are about to find it, I pray as you find it today, you will stay there, you will never depart in the name of Jesus and you will know that indeed it is the right place to be in the name of Jesus. Now, before we go into today's uh, sermon, let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you. Thank you, Lord. For you are God and there is none like you. Thank you for making this uh, meeting possible again this day. Lord, I commit everything we shall do in this meeting to your hand this day. Lord, I ask you to take absolute control in the name of Jesus. Let it be simply glorious unto you, my Lord and my Savior. And let all the blessings be ours, Lord. For in Jesus' name, we are prayed. Amen and amen. Now, today we are going to a brand new topic by the grace by the grace of God, and it's simply titled "Believers Before Faced in Your Work to Truly Represent Jesus Christ." Believers before faced in your work to truly represent Jesus Christ. What does that mean? It simply means as believers, as children of God. We ought to copy, if I can use that language, we ought to do things the way the Lord Jesus Christ has done it, as example for us. And that is to say that we ought to live our lives in such a way that will be glorifying unto him and that will truly represent him in our conduct, in our character, in our conversation. And people will know that indeed, these ones are the children of God. Amen? That's what we are dealing with today. And uh, we are taking our main text from the book of John, chapter 13, uh, from verse 1 to 17. Uh, it's called a case study for a balanced approach to leadership as exemplified in the Osimoronic servant leadership teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, I'll read. So when he had washed their feet, taking his garments, and sat down again, he said to them, Do you know what I've done to you? You call me teacher and Lord. And so, and you say, Well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I've given you an example that you should do as I've done to you. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. That's from John chapter 13, from verse 12 to 17. Now, of course, we have uh, our supporting Bible text. Uh, this has to do with the visions of the Lord Jesus Christ. Or we can say 
the vision of gods are seen by some men of God in the scripture. Uh, we, are, we are looking at Ezekiel chapter 1 from verse 6 to verse 28. And then another one, Ezekiel chapter 10, of course. Revelation chapter 4 from verse 6 to 9. And of course, the book of Isaiah, the prophet, chapter 6, verses 1 to 3. Note, because this is very example, if we if we have read that, I mean, those portions of Bible before, or we are familiar with them, Ezekiel saw the vision of God twice, detailing the features of the four living creatures that he confirmed as the cherubim, going back to chapter 10. He first saw that vision in chapter 1, very detailed vision, and uh, in chapter 10 of Ezekiel, when the glory of God was about departing from the land of uh, Israel, Judah precisely, after the captivity, I mean, immediately they were held into captivity, he saw another vision. And this vision actually confirmed exactly what he saw back in uh, chapter 1 of the book of Ezekiel. Amen. Now, since we have this uh, supporting Bible text in about three or four Bible passages and even Bible books, we want to only use the Ezekiel's case as our focus because it captures what we need to learn in relation to our today's uh, topic that believers should be forfeited in their walk with the Lord to truly represent Him. So that's what we're going to be using now. There's a summary I have here, because this is not our main text, but it brings together what we're going to be talking about in our main text, just as I've read it. And that's why we're going to deal with it first. That's the way we do on this program. The supporting Bible passage or passages actually usher us into our main text of the day. Amen. Because we use that to prepare our background so that we can have a kind of a robust approach to our understanding of the topic at hand. And I pray God Almighty himself will quicken our heart today for understanding and then we will have what is called heart knowledge that will be for the rest of our lives, even in understanding how to represent him in the name of Jesus. Now, I have this uh, summary I'll quickly run through from the book of Ezekiel chapter 1. Uh, each had four faces. This is talking about the four living creatures. That of a man, a lion, an ox, and a an hero. In their appearance, the cherubim had the likeness of a man. This cherubim used two of their wings for flying and the other two for covering their bodies. Under their wings, the cherubim appeared to have the form or likeness of a man's hand. Of course, chapter 1 and 10 of the book of Ezekiel describe the four living creatures. Ezekiel chapter 1 verse 5 as the same beings as the cherubim in, in Ezekiel chapter 10, like I explained the other time. The cherubim service, I mean, rather, the, cher the cherubim serve the purpose of magnifying the holiness and power of God. This is one of their main responsibilities throughout the Bible. In addition to praising God, they, are also, they also serve as a visible reminder of the majesty and glory of God and his abiding presence with his people. That actually is a quote from uh, God questions. Amen. Now, we have some revelation that we brought out again to support those points. And this revelation we have, I believe, goes a, li a, li a little bit deeper to explain what was seen 
in the presence of God by Ezekiel, by Prophet Isaiah, and of course, John the Revelator, to the book of Revelation. What was it that they saw? And what they saw, what was it telling us? Who that will be, we that will be coming in, in the year to come, talking about that time now, to know and to understand what the presence of God means. This is very important because this actually is what we eventually found out when the Lord Jesus Christ himself walked the heart. He came in such a way that that presence of God was seen in the record taken of him. So that will tell you the Bible is all the same. You cannot divide the Bible. Now, let's go to that revelation. The God's presence was represented symbolically by four living creatures whose appearances were uniquely detailed to showcase God's awesomeness and awesomeness in holiness, unparalleled in long suffering, completeness in authority and majesty, and irrefutable in judgment. The hard knowing, all powerful, and ever, consist, ever consistent God is revealed symbolically, symbolically in vision to Ezekiel so that he could picture God's righteousness in judgment and his faithfulness to deliver his people at the appropriate time. The covering of God's plan for his people is consistent with his character and he will never fail to judge evil and reward good. Amen. That God's glory is expressed in the image of his only begotten Son, who is above all power and principalities, in majesty and authority. All these revelations were taken from the vision seen by Ezekiel. Of course, same was also uh, recorded in the book of uh, uh, Revelation as well, we have it also in the book of Isaiah. There's an allusion to it in the book of Isaiah. So that's why we're using the book of Ezekiel that has a form of more detailed information for us. Now, let's quickly go into the background to further buttress what we have discussed regarding the vision. And in natural life, of course, this background is actually talking about how God Almighty, when he came in human form, presented himself, and this is talking about his presence, really, in four different accounts of the gospel. And yet, we have one gospel, not four gospels. You should have asked yourself, why would it be necessary that four people precisely will write the accounts of the ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ as a work they, uh, as a work they have. It was because God had in mind for us to understand that his presence means more than just looking at him from one hand. And for us to learn that lesson, he has given us Bible to study. Amen. In natural life, we talk about living a balanced lifestyle. The nutritionists will advise that to get the best out of the food you eat, you need a balanced diet. This also applies, of course, to spiritual life. The Bible says, bodily exercise profits a little, but godliness is profitable for all things. Having promise of the life that now is and that which is to come. That's from the book of 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8. Also, I want you to remember that the little profit of bodily exercise is essential for a balanced lifestyle for a child of God. <laughs> Those who study science will have understood that very well. That when you say essential element and trace element, it's not saying that something is little in amount that is not important. It's just that you don't need so much of it. That 
exercise that is required makes it all balanced. So we are talking about how God Almighty has done everything to give us a balanced approach of himself as God Almighty. The Bible gives indications, not always explicitly, but at the minimum, implicitly, the balanced nature of God by which he has set the universe in divine harmony, absence of which will result into chaos. Of course, in each of the occasions of the visions of God's presence in the Bible, there is unmistakable indication of absolute order, completeness, uniformity, and of course, unmitigated here of majestic oversight. This tells us, it tells of God's perfection to be about balance in all things. The only exception to that is that the balanced attribute of God is devoid of the presence of evil. Amen. The Bible says in Psalm 89 verse 14, Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your truth. Mercy and truth go before your face. This is a statement of balance and honor with no compromise of anything suggestive of evil. Because when the, when the children of this world we talk about balance, they are going to be mixing evil, mostly they start with the evil, and they kind of sprinkle some things they believe, <laughs> maybe those things are spiritual in their understanding, they sprinkle it on it, and they say, well, let's try and have a balance. The balance we are talking about is pure, and that is of God Almighty Himself. Amen. Let's talk about the inspiration of the Bible. Now, when I say the Bible, I'm actually referring to that portion of the Bible, the Gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. The inspiration of the writers of the four Gospels was uniquely woven, or was a uniquely woven tapestry, talking about the writers, that is, it confined them, it restricted them to divine source and perspective, but also gave them a setting of order that is reflective of God's authority in putting individual elements of a composite to work together in forming an all grand or robust picture of the whole. In a nutshell, each writer received just enough inspiration to form a unique part of the sum total of what we now know as the gospel of Jesus Christ. Remember, we don't call it the gospels. It's called the gospel of Jesus Christ. Of course, Matthew wrote his own part of the gospel from Jesus' kingly background. Mark did his own work from his service perspective. Luke the physician focused on his humanity, that is, the Son of Man. And of course, John, the beloved, <laughs> wrote about his divinity or deity as the Son of God. What a complete picture. Let's move on to the authorship. I'm saying this because you can know God is so perfect. So he did not just present himself anyhow. He wanted us to have a detailed information. Only if we do due diligence in studying the scripture, we will see exactly what the Lord has presented to us. The authors were from different backgrounds that suited them most for their individual assignment. All the writers but Luke were Jews who through their Jewish background understood the context of the Holy Spirit's dictates. And also, their individual roles as writing evangelist or author was kind of prescribed to follow that order. Amen. Look, the only Gentile amongst the writers had former training of a physician to present Jesus' humanity in an, un in an unbiased manner. Having the Holy Spirit as the instructor 
and the supervisor. Amen. Now, let's talk about the content. Because that's very important. All the content now from different four uh, authors. Of course, the Holy Spirit was the author. They're talking about the human author. And the context came together to form one piece of document. That, will, that should have given us some good spinach. How did that come about? But you know, for, for a lot of us, we take things for granted. But this is never to be taken for granted. Amen. The content of each gospel account is delineated to show the purpose of the writing. This is consistent with the vision of God as represented in the scripture to have four faces of the four living creatures that were seen where God revealed his presence. Amen. Of course, like I said the other time, I'll run through it again because I need to link it with the other part of what it means so that we can have a complete picture, uh, picture of it. Matthew, of course, reflects on kingly genealogy of Jesus Christ through Davidic lineage. This is his face of lion. Mark, of course, recalls no genealogy but focuses on Jesus' I mean on Jesus' obedience as obedient servant, whose every step fulfilled prophecies about his servanthood. Of course, this represents his face of an ox. The book of Luke presents the humanity of Jesus Christ, that is the Son of Man, his face of a man. Book of John. Let's go from John chapter 20, verse 31. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. And of course, this represents his face of an evil. Amen. Now, we have tried to tie those four faces of each of the four living creatures. We have tried to tie them with what we have in the four accounts of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And what we have said, if you study the Bible, is very, very consistent. And what we are saying today is for us as students of God, we need to emulate the pattern the master left for us. We are never to do anything different. Actually, to truly represent him. Are we going to get everything at once? Well, that may be difficult. But as we try to be more like him, a perfect example, I believe we can grow to understand more and more and be more like the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, I'm going to go into the Word of God to quickly talk about some of the Bible passages. I have about three or four of them here. Refined specifically to a believer's position in the Lord Jesus Christ. That is, showing believers different faces for consistency with Christ's likeness. Amen. The first one I will choose is from the book of Ephesians. This is walking in the footsteps of the master for service. The book of Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. That is, believers are saved unto good works in Christ Jesus. Amen. Also, we have uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God. A worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Amen. So let's go further and talk about the divine attributes shared through the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, I mean the divine attributes shared by believers, Christians, through the Lord Jesus Christ. First Peter chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. His own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Who once were not a people, but are now the people of God. Who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. You see, as believers, we are talking about our position so that we know who we are. 
So representing, we know how we are supposed to stand. When it's time to suffer for the cause of our Lord Jesus Christ, for the cause of the gospel, we know what we're doing is according to the word of God. When it's time for us to stand as children of God, peculiar people, holy nation, unshakable people, we have to stand, knowing fully well that this is according to the word of God. Amen. We're going to talk about another Bible passage now. This is also taken from 2 Peter. So the first one was taken from 1 Peter. This is from 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 2 and 4. We are talking about divine attributes that we need to know that we have as children of God in standing for the Lord Jesus Christ. Of course, this divine attribute also kind of intertwines with the kingly attributes we share with the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. As his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue. By which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises. That through this you may be partakers of the divine nature. Having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Let's move on to sovereign with Christ. Of course, we can see this in the book of John, chapter 16, verse 33. <coughs> These things are spoken to you. This was the Lord Jesus Christ speaking here. That in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Also, let's read 2 Corinthians chapter 4 from verse 7 to 10. As written by Apostle Paul. But we have the treasure in acting vessels, that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. We are hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. Amen. We can go on and on looking at some other Bible passages that clearly tell us our position as believers, as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. And these are the things we are trying to talk about today, so that when we go out to preach the gospel to represent the Lord Jesus Christ, we know who we are. We are not just ordinary people. The Lord himself has given us examples of how we are supposed to live. Let's look at another one. Obedience in humanity now. I'll take this from the book of uh, Matthew, chapter 17, chapter two, uh, verse 25 to 27. And he said, yes, and when he had come into the house, Jesus anticipated him, saying, What do you think, Simon? For whom did the kings of this act take customs or taxes? From their sons or from strangers? Peter said to him, from strangers. Jesus said to him, then the sons are free. Nevertheless, lest we offend them, go to the sea, cast in a cast in a hook, and take the fish that comes up first. And when you have opened its mouth, you will find a piece of money. Take that and give it to them for me and you. This was the Lord Jesus Christ making it sure to his followers that we need to observe and obey the rule of the land. This is very important so that we don't put spirituality over what is natural. You cannot represent God well when you are defying the law of the land and you are claiming to be a spiritual person. In essence, you'll be like a rogue because that is not according to the word of God. So the law showed a good example by letting us know 
how this is to be done, how we need to understand. In another passage in the gospel, actually the Lord was being tested and they were asking his disciple whether he will pay or he's been paying temple tax. <laughs> I, I think it was a uh, one of those periods of the feast. And the disciple answered them and said, Well, of course, the master will always pay his taxes. And then they came and they threw a question at the Lord. And the question they threw at him was if it was really something expected of the Jews or of him to pay the tax. So they wanted to use that to trap him. So you can see that as children of God, we need to understand that Lord laid examples for us. And the Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ answered them that they should render unto Caesar what belonged to Caesar and unto God what belonged to God. That was the end of that uh, text they thought they were bringing to the Lord Jesus Christ. So what are we saying here? As believers, we need to understand that God created all things. According to what we have here, yeah, I'm going to read it so that it brings it clearer out, out for us. Romans chapter 13, 1 to 2. This was Apostle Paul, right? See, this is a corroboration of what we are saying. Let every soul be subject to governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God. And the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, Whoever receives the authority receives the ordinance of God. And those who receive will bring judgment on themselves. So, next time you see a brother or sister trying to flood the law of the land, please kindly tell him, her, you are sinning against God first. So, you have no excuse. And this is one of the positions we need to understand we are talking about. We are to be forfeited in our service to our master. So don't talk about spirituality when there are some natural laws for you to observe because you live today as an economic agent within this same environment where you live, you buy or you sell, you enjoy things in that environment, you're supposed to be a contributor to that same environment in the manner that will make the environment godly. Sadly, we know things don't always go the way we think, but that doesn't mean that as believers, we don't play our part right. Amen. We are true. So, I will say that we are not going to our main text for more illumination on the subject for today's sermon. Why did I say more, more illumination? Because it seems we have covered some ground. But the truth of the matter is that Lord Jesus Christ also exemplified it. In action, he showed it. And that's why we are using that portion of the Bible as our main test for today. I'm going to read the revelation we have this uh, from this out to us. And that is talking about our main test for today. That is from the book of John chapter 13 from verse 1 to 17. We can see and a lot of us without wasting too much time. As believers, I believe a lot of us have read this Bible passage several times, and by the grace of God, we know what it means, but in applying this Bible passage to how we run our own lives, or how we do the work of ministry, we fall short. So why do we fall short? I see this as, you know, the problem with mankind, because the Lord was saying, that if you should obey this, if you will obey this, you will do well. In my journey as a child of God, I've never seen so many good examples of maybe you call them pastors, evangelists, or church leaders for that matter, uh, matter who will live according to what the Lord Jesus Christ has, has left for us to observe, especially in the area of living or showing good examples as leaders. 
Human beings always gravitate towards making people to worship them. The Lord did not leave that for us. Amen. That's a wrong position. If you are listening to me as a pastor, evangelist, or whatever title you have in your church or in your organization, try to emulate the Lord Jesus Christ. He has given us a good example to live with. Amen. Now, the first instruction in wisdom will result in understanding to follow the Lord's precepts and ways. That is, it will follow instructions in wisdom. The wisdom only comes from above, and that is from the Word of God. Amen. Every spiritual assignment requires a place and time of preparation so that the worker in the vineyard may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. You see, when the Lord washed the feet of the disciples on that night, that was before he was arrested. The Lord knew what he was leaving behind for the disciples to take over. And he said he had to show them what he expected of them to live with after he has gone back to his father. And we that are now, we call ourselves the present day disciples, how come we have moved away from the precept of the Lord? That's a very great question for everyone. And we need to go back. We need to go back to the basis. Amen. The vessel of honor will perform honorable tasks for the kingdom of God. Having been sanctified and consecrated to the Lord. But everyone that refuses the knowledge of God is doomed for judgment. For children of God, the judgment they will receive is loss of reward. But for those who are outside yet to turn themselves over to the Lord Jesus Christ, that is referring to eternal damnation. And I pray. If there is anyone here this day that has not given their lives to the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray that you do it today and you will not let this day go without doing that. Amen. The way up in the kingdom of God is being dead to one's personal ego, desires, ambitions, but alive to serving God by serving others with love, humility, Sincerity and making the Lord Jesus Christ the object of our faith and service. I think that covers it all. And the Lord showed it, He has amplified it. Don't forget, our topic for today is as believers, we are supposed to be forfeited. The way the Lord Jesus Christ showed it. We are never to do anything different from what He showed us. He laid it for us so that we can live like that. But I can tell you. What we see nowadays is <laughs> nothing to write to me about. People have defined their own gospel. In fact, when we talk about the Osimoronic uh, servant leadership, <laughs> there's nothing like that in the lives of most of the Christians that I know. What they do is actually reversing what the Lord Jesus Christ left. They want to be worshipped as God. And they take worship from men because they see themselves having been placed on a higher pedestal, so they see themselves as being more important than any other believer. This is a very sad situation for children of God to be. I pray if you operate in this situation, that you will change your heart and let the Holy Spirit minister to you. Amen. And for all believers, I pray by the great special grace of God, we will live our lives in full understanding of the examples that were given to us. Amen. Now, let's quickly run through some what we believe those two Bible passages that we have used, both for the main text and the supporting text, what they have brought out for us as believers. The first one we have here is follow strictly the wisdom that we receive through studying the word of God, meditation upon the word of God, prayers, and the inspiration we receive from the Holy Spirit. Don't let man teach you or tell you what God is trying to tell you. You have Bible, you can study the Bible. 
You can pray, open your mouth. You can spend time to meditate upon the word of God. And you can listen and be still and let the Holy Spirit minister to you. All these things are very important for us to understand the word of God. The way we are supposed to understand the word of God. And we go and represent him being forfeited to showcase Christ's likeness. Amen. We should be ready for time of training and impartation by the Holy Spirit for any assignment he has for us to truly represent the Lord Jesus Christ. I've heard and I've seen of so many people who call themselves pastors, evangelists, without any preparation at all, and you see them just all over the place. They are not representing God, they represent themselves. Because they are trying to make themselves known. And the Lord said, you cannot be greater than, than he who has sent you. But unfortunately, you have turned deaf ears to that warning. I admonish you today that you consider your way. Amen. We are to be a vessel of honor unto the kingdom of God. The way we represent in, in our conduct, in our conversation, I've said that before, and in our character. This is talking about Christ's likeness. Amen. We are to be leaders whose focus is on Jesus Christ and devoid of any personal aggrandizement, but fully devoted to doing God's will by being a leader of the Lord's example. Would you, would you like to be a leader of the Lord's example? If you would like to be a leader of the Lord's example, go and study the Bible. <laughs> Especially that portion of the Bible we are dealing with today. That will show you how the Lord Jesus Christ himself has lived for us as example. He said, you call me Lord. He said, that is true. But let me show you the other side that you have not known. And he said to his disciples, after I've done this, later on you'll find out, you'll realize why I've done this. And I hope, even as we live our lives for him, we'll realize what we are supposed to do. Amen. God's eyes are everywhere to see those who will stand for him, irrespective of their situation. So that he also will back them up with his divine honor and promotion. God's rewards are always dear for the children of God to enjoy. He will never deny us of any good thing. We only need to walk according to his precepts. And then we'll see exactly what the Lord has done for us. Amen. Now, a word of admonition. And I've taken this from the book of Philippians, chapter 3, verses 12 to 14. And this is quoting Apostle Paul. Not that I have already attained, or I am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. I press forward. I press toward the goal for the price of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. I want to advise you, my brother, my sister, if this sermon today has taught you one way or the other, and you have been living your way of life just the way you perceived it to be from your own instinct, I want to advise you not to relent, you can still change from today and start doing exactly the way the master has left it for us to do. Like Apostle Paul, he wasn't, he wasn't considering himself to have arrived to use our modern day language. He didn't, himself, he didn't see himself as the big shot, the one everybody will have to report to. He said he was looking forward 
any for one. We can do the same thing so that we can truly represent the one who has sent us. Christians nowadays are just doing what they like that we don't see in the word of God to truly represent him. And I pray that the Lord God Almighty will help each and every one of us to think over this sermon today and let the Lord through his Holy Spirit change our lives in following the steps of our master. Amen. Let me move further by quickly talking to those among us or those who are listening or watching us at all who by now have not given their lives to the Lord Jesus Christ. Please, contrary to what you have been made to believe, that God loves everyone, including those who willfully reject him. That's nothing like that. The Bible says in Psalm 7, verse 11, God is a just judge, and God is angry with the wicked every day. Now, the wicked every day according to the word of God, and another portion of the word of God is, is talking about those who have willfully turned their back to the love of God. The love of God is the Lord Jesus Christ that he gave us, his only begotten son. Willfully you have rejected him, you are wicked. So there's no way to look at it. But you can turn around today and turn a new leaf. That's where we're going. Because God is massive. The door is still open for you. The Bible says, in the book of John, chapter 3, verse 36, He who believes in the Son has everlasting life. And he who does not believe the Son shall not see life. But the wrath of God abides on him. I pray that the wrath of God that has been abiding on whoever has not called the Lord Jesus Christ, his Lord and Savior, up up to now, has been living under the wrath of God, according to the word of God. I believe that wrath, as you make decision today, will be lifted, and you can start a new chapter of your life in the Lord Jesus Christ, and see the reason why you are born into this life. Amen. A link will be coming on the screen. It will take you to our website where we have prepared a page for you to have better understanding of what we are talking about. And I believe as you do that, trying to give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord himself, through his Holy Spirit, will minister to you and you'll be able to see that indeed you're not born to live the way you're living. You are born to live according to the plan of God for your life. Amen. Shall we? Father Lord, we thank you. Thank you for you are good. And there's none like you. Thank you for your word that has gone out. Father, I pray that in the hearts of your children, to live for you, being who you have called them to be, representing you in conduct, in character, and in conversation. Father, I pray what we have learned today will continue to ring in our hearts, even to live for you all the days of our lives. And for some of us who have been given wrong information, or we grew up learning wrong things about how to represent God, I pray today that God Almighty will open your heart especially through the sermon, you'll be able to see the truth of the word of God and represent him the right way. And also I pray for those who are going to want to know Jesus' page. I pray that even as they do it in obedience and they open their hearts, is according to the word of God. The Lord himself will meet with them through his Holy Spirit and they will begin a new chapter of life today, which is a real life, really. Thank you, our Lord and our Savior. For in Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Thank you, everyone. And until next time, I will see you again on this program. God bless you.
Jesus died for us all so we can have life. Come to him and receive life, believe on him and thirst no more. Good news reporting is all we do, seeing souls saved is our ministry, 